And so I'm going to go ahead and just, I'm going to tell you what my assignment is for this morning, and then we are going to jump straight in. Number one, I'm going to teach you about what the Holy Spirit, what the Spirit of God did in the Old Testament. And then number two, I'm going to preach a little bit about how the Spirit of God wants to move and work in your life. But I'm going to open with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. This comes from a uh, sermon that he preached called The Teaching of the Holy Ghost. It's a little long, it's a little wordy, but it's really important, and there are a couple little nuggets in here that I think uh, are worth taking away. So here we go. There are many choice gifts comprehended in the covenant of grace, but the first and richest of them are these twain. The gift of Jesus Christ for us, and the gift of the Holy Ghost to us. The first of these I trust we are not likely to undervalue. We delight to hear of that unspeakable gift, the Son of God, who bare our sin and carried our sorrows and endured our punishment in his own body on the tree. There is something so tangible in the cross, the nails, the vinegar, the spear, that we are not able to forget the Master. But the second great gift is by no means inferior to the first. The gift of the Holy Spirit to us is so spiritual, yet we are so carnal. It is so mysterious, yet we are so material that we are very apt to forget its value, I even to forget it altogether. And yet, my brethren, let us Ever remember that Christ on the cross is of no value to us apart from the Holy Spirit in us. In vain that blood is flowing unless the finger of the Spirit applies the blood to our conscience. In vain is that garment of righteousness wrought out, a garment without seam woven from the top throughout unless the Holy Spirit wraps it around us and arrays us in its costly folds. The river of the water of life cannot quench our thirst till the Spirit presents the goblet to our lips. This is what I want you to understand this morning, that the Spirit of God is active in your life, and it is every bit as uh, powerful in your every day as the blood was on the day that you said, wash me clean, I am yours, Jesus. That is what I want you to take away this morning. We're going to jump into the Old Testament into Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13. This is where um, the Israelites are being led out of Egypt. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. Verse number 17, we're going to go through 22. Number 17. When Pharaoh released the people, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearby. For God said, lest the people change their minds and return to Egypt when they experience war. So God brought the people around the way of the desert to the Red Sea, and the Israelites went up from the land of Egypt prepared for battle. Let's take two takeaways right here. This has absolutely nothing to do with where I am going, but it are two really important takeaways that if we can just glean these, I think uh, we'll find a lot of peace in our walk, um, our everyday walk with the Holy Spirit. Number one, there were two paths for the Israelites out of captivity, and neither of them were ideal to their eyes. One led to a hostile enemy. The other led through the desert to a seemingly dead end of the Red Sea. I want you to understand that sometimes the Holy Spirit will do things in your life and will lead you to areas of your life that look like, where is this even going to (laughs) go? Like, there's nothing there, God. But he is leading you away from an enemy or he's leading you towards a blessing, or he's leading you towards something else, but it may not look with natural eyes what it actually is if you could see through spiritual eyes. Number two 
is that God very clearly did not reveal to the Israelites where they were going because it says that they left dressed for war. Why would you dress for war if you're about to stretch through the desert and about to come up on the Red Sea? God is not required to tell us where we're going all the time. We are, we are actually just required to be obedient and to follow. Verse 19, Moses took, those bone, took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the Israelites solemnly swear, God will surely attend to you, and you will carry my bones up from this place with you. Another takeaway that I want you to hear real quick, and then we're going to start getting into some of the meat of this. Carry God's promises with you. When he makes a promise, he is faithful to complete it. Even after that promise seems long dead, long rotten, long stinky, sometimes those promises when they come back up cannot even be fun, but he is faithful to fulfill them, carry them with you in your coming and your going, in your day and your night and your private life and your public life. Hold on to the promises of God. Because that's where you're going to ultimately find your comfort, your truth, when you don't know where else to turn in the capital T, truth of the word. Number 20, they journeyed from Sukkoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the desert or wilderness. Now the Lord was going before them by day in a pillar of clouds to lead them in the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel day or night. He did not remove the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night before the people. The cloud and the fire were the spirit of God leading his people through the desert. They were physical, visual representations of the presence of God. See, back then, because Jesus had not come and made sin, uh, a way for sin to be rectified with the Father, because that had not happened yet, the presence of God could not actually be in the same place as a human was because we human sinners, not having our sins atoned, would literally just burn up in the flame of the presence of God. It just, it couldn't be. It would just disintegrate. So this spirit of God is leading them from a distance as a cloud in the sky or as fire in the sky because he couldn't just be down here telling us, hey, here, go do this, go talk to that person, go say this thing, do that thing, because we couldn't handle it as mere humans not saved yet by blood and grace. Now, we're going to jump to Exodus 40. We're going to be there for just two verses, and I don't even have these on the screen. I don't want you to even turn there. Uh, I want you to go ahead, though, and turn to Numbers chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9. I'm going to speak a little bit about Exodus 40, and then we're going to jump to Numbers 9, verse 15. In Exodus 40, verse 1 through 32, uh, we hear described the building of the tabernacle by Moses. Moses started building the tabernacle when the Lord spoke to him on the first day of the first month of the second year after leaving Egypt. The important thing that I want us to, to, uh, the one word I want us to remember throughout all of this is obedience. Obedience in the right time makes it obedience, but obedience in the wrong time becomes delayed obedience, which becomes disobedience. So in verse 1 through 32, we read a whole bunch of the details of how Moses constructed the tabernacle, what it kind of looked like, what its form was like. And then in verse 33, it says, And he, being Moses, set up the courtyard around the tabernacle on the altar and put the curtain at the gate of the courtyard. So Moses finished the work. That's the important part here is that Moses finished the work. Verse number 34 says, Then... After Moses finished the work, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting or the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
So now we're going to jump to Numbers 9. Because after verse 34 in Exodus 40, it's really the same thing that it's talking about. But this really paints an incredible picture of how the Israelites were led through the desert by the Spirit of God. So Numbers 9, verse 15. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And from evening until morning, there was a fiery appearance over the tabernacle. This is the way that it used to be continually. The cloud would cover it by day, and there was a fiery appearance by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that, the Israelites would begin their journey. And whenever, whatever place the cloud settled, there the Israelites would make camp. And I'm going to skip the rest of these verses that I was going to read because they basically just say this. If, if the Spirit of God, if the cloud of the presence of God rested over the tabernacle for one day, two days, 20 days, a year, they stayed right there. And then the moment it was lifted, it was time to go. And whether it was for one day, two days, 20 days, or a year of traveling, if that cloud was lifted, they were going. And again, I just, I want to just paint this picture of what it was like to see, to witness, to be um, in participation with the Spirit of God in this time, because there was not this conscience voice in the back of your head. There was not this, oh, well, the Lord spoke to me and I need to tell you this. That, that, that was only happening with a very, very, very select few group of people who were righteous in the Lord's eyes and that were allowed to actually be in the presence to actually hear the voice of the Father. Otherwise, there was this separation and it had to be that way. It was mercy for it to be that way. And it talks about if, if the cloud came over at dusk and it raised at dawn, then they would sleep at dusk and at dawn they would go. And if it went, came at dawn and left at dusk, the op, you get what I'm saying? It, it didn't matter what the Spirit did, they obeyed. They followed. They understood that the Lord is leading me, leading us. And at the time, it was one spirit of God for thousands of Israelites. That's, it's going to be important in a minute. That this is how the Lord led the Israelites, by literally picking up his presence, moving it to a new place, and expected his people to follow suit. Trusting that he knew where he was going. He knew where he was leading. He knew what they needed. He knew who they needed to avoid. He knew who they needed to encounter. He knew the hunger that they needed to experience in a season. And he knew the fullness they needed to experience in another season. And then again, the takeaway here is the obedience of the following of the Spirit of God because it never leads us wrong. So I told you that I was going to teach a little bit and that I was going to preach a little bit. So I am done teaching. Are you ready for me to just preach just a little bit? This isn't going to be super long, but let's turn to John 14. We're going to go to the New Testament now. And this is where Jesus is telling of the Holy Spirit coming, the advocate coming in Jesus's absence. John 14, verse 15 through 17. He starts off with a qualifier. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Then I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Jesus had just finished telling them, hey, I'm going back to the right hand of the Father. I'm leaving this earth. He's already died. He's already been resurrected. He has reappeared to the disciples, and he's giving instructions for the future. For The, future. the Spirit of truth, verse 17, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot accept 
because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he resides with you and will be in you. The dwelling place of the Lord, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God, must not be lost on us. The Bible so clearly teaches that when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior over our life, when we have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, when we surrender our lives to the kingdom of heaven, when we become kingdom or uh, citizens of that kingdom instead of citizens of this earth, we are filled with the Spirit of God. It moves and acts and speaks in our lives. And it is asking for you to obey and to follow. At one time, the Spirit of God was confined to one place for all people. Remember the cloud and the fire, one presence, all people. At another time, the grace of God was displayed by the single presence of God being on earth in the form of Jesus Christ. And at this time, the glory of God is that he has now sent his spirit to live inside of each and every one of us who claim Jesus Christ as Lord, who pursue after him, who live our lives as Christians. That is our roadmap, so to speak, through life. We are now no longer one presence for all people. We are one on one with the spirit of God. One on one, that is my title for today's message. It has taken me this long to tell you my title. I promise I only have like 15 minutes left. <laughs> one on one with the presence of God. And it is so important that we understand and we grasp and we cling to the revelation that we no longer have to go through a priest or through a, a dedicated individual to get to God, to petition God, to be in the presence of God. He is right here with us right now ready to meet your every need, ready to lead you down the right path, ready to, to mend, ready to restore right now. And the only thing it's waiting on is for you to submit, to say, okay, God, here I am. I'm ready to obey. I'm ready to go when you say go and speak when you say speak and do when you say do. Like the clouds and the fire led the Israelites. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you wants to lead you and to guide you into truth and into righteousness, into provision, into miracles, into gifts of the Spirit, into many, many blessings. It also, though, don't misunderstand, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is also to convict. And we've got to leave room in our lives, especially as Americans who think that we have everything together and we know it all and that it's our way or the highway. There has to be room left in our walk with Jesus for the Holy Spirit to speak and convict us and rid us of things that are not holy and righteous and Christ-like. These are all aspects of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. It's mysterious, yet it's not ambiguous at all. The Bible doesn't tell us why the Spirit would, the, uh, the cloud or the fire would lift at one time and then move and then set in another place. It doesn't tell us, oh, well, I was moving them away from an army that was coming, or I was moving them towards uh, fresher food, or I was moving them for this lesson or X, Y, Z reason. The Bible doesn't say that, at least not in the, the passage of scripture that we read. But here's what I do know. He did it for their good. When the spirit leads, he's leading you for the will of the father. And the will of the Father is always good to you. And before you say, yeah, well, how can always God always be good when? Because the Bible teaches that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I don't know all the answers 
to the ifs, the whens, the buts, the what ifs, the how comes. I don't know. But he's still good. He's still working. He's still moving. He's still breathing. It was what the, the Israelites perceived as a dead end, the Red Sea, that ultimately became, in a sense, their salvation. You see, at another point, the Egyptian army, Pharaoh, got angry over the fact that Israelites had left. See, they had been gone for a little while, and then all of a sudden, this jealousy just started bubbling back up in him, and he couldn't stand the fact that he gave in to this God that he doesn't even believe in. So he decided, you know what, I'm going to go get him back. And he starts pursuing. And it's as the Israelites get to the Red Sea, this dead end, that the Spirit of God splits the sea and allows for dry land for them to walk through. But that's only part of the miracle. The rest of the miracle is that when they got to the other side and their enemies were closing in, that same spirit that held up the waters for his people crashed in the waters on those coming against his people. And that's the promise of the Lord is that not everything's going to be pretty, not everything's going to be easy, not everything's going to make sense, but it's all in the plan. And if you'll stick to the plan, the Father will be glorified, and that's all this is about. Waste away my body, I don't care, but bring glory to the Father. For the, the Bible says, don't be concerned about the clothes on your back or what you're going to eat or what you look like or even what you feel like. But be obedient to the will of the Father. For those things pass away, but the kingdom of God is eternal. What kingdom are you participating in your citizenship in? You see, there are, man, this is a whole other summer for another day. There are privileges and rights as a citizen, and there are equally responsibilities as a citizen. As a citizen. We have certain rights as Americans, and we have certain responsibilities as Americans. But keeping that in balance, if all we focus on are our rights and we neglect our responsibilities, those rights are gonna, be, are gonna plummet and our responsibilities are gonna become uh, unbearable. But when we keep things in line, the same is true within the kingdom of God. We have rights as heirs to the kingdom. The Bible says that ask anything in my name. Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it will be granted unto you. That is a right within the will of God. Within the will of God, that is a right that you get to have. It is a right that you get to have to have the Holy Spirit live inside of you if you are a born-again Christian. It is a right that you get to, a benefit that you get to partake in, to partake of the Lord's Supper and remember what Jesus Christ did for us. But we have responsibilities to let that not be lost on us either, that we have responsibilities to stand up for the poor, that we have responsibilities to stand up for the widows. We have responsibility to be salt and light into this world. And we do that through the leading and the guiding of the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Doing the right thing at the wrong time makes it the wrong thing. But when the Holy Spirit speaks and you obey, eternities can just change. You don't know what that person prayed two minutes before you walked up. You don't know the need that they had been waiting for a breakthrough in. And you don't know that God wasn't waiting to use you to bring it. If you ever feel foolish for obeying the draw of the Holy Spirit to do something, it's probably the right thing to do. If it seems a little uncomfortable, a little unconventional, if it seems a little within reason, God is a God of order, okay? If, 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 if you feel like the Holy Spirit's telling you to stand up and take your clothes off and start running around, I'm going to tell you, sit down, shut up. That ain't, that ain't it. That ain't it. <laughs> but if he leads you after the service to lay hands on someone and say, hey, how can I pray for you? I just feel like the Lord's you should probably do that, even if you don't know their name, even if you should know their name, but you don't. You see, we have 
better. This is the revelation that the Lord gave me this week. We have better than one presence on all people. We have the presence of God surrounding us on every side, working in us and through us and for us. And we've got to be cognitively aware of this in our everyday lives. To sin against the grace that you received is a spit in the face of what Jesus did on the cross. To disregard the direction and the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit in your life is to spit in the face of the Spirit who makes all of this possible. How much more are we called to obey the Spirit that lives in us than the Spirit that came in a cloud? How much more responsibility do we have when we don't have as much excuse? At least, at least they could have been like, dude, that's just like whatever clouds are made of. <laughs> you know, air in the sky. Oh, that's just fire. There must be something crazy happening in the atmosphere. You know, like they, you could brush that off a little bit easier than when you recognize the spirit that lives inside of you is speaking to you and you hear that and you choose to ignore. I think there's going to be some harsher consequences for disobedience from us who the spirit is alive and active in than there were for them who only had uh, a, a, a portion of the presence of God active in their lives. I'm going to start closing with this. And um, Mickey, why don't you come on and, uh, and just give me some keys. Um, we're going to close with this. Psalm 23. You don't need to turn there. Y'all know this. If you've been in the church for any amount of time, you know this. Verse 1 through 3, I'm going to read them in a different translation than... Uh, Maybe most of us have ever read it. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He takes me to lush pastures. He leads me to refreshing water. He restores my strength. Now, here's the part I want you to hear He leads me down the right paths for the sake of His reputation. for the sake of his reputation, not for the sake of your prosperity, not for the sake of your comfortability, not for the sake of your rights, not for the sake of your preferences. He leads you down the right path for the sake of his reputation because your path may not look right to you, you may not be privy to the destination, but just because you were not the one who typed that address into Waze or Google Maps doesn't mean that the directions you're being fed are incorrect. The Israelites were promised a promised land. They were not told where it was, what it was going to look like, what it was going to feel like. They were just told, I have a place for you. Now follow me there. They weren't perfect along the way. I think that's an important thing we need to note. They weren't perfect along the way. There were times that the spirit was removed because they would build um, idols, because their, their faith would turn away. No, we're not under that same covenant anymore. The, the presence of God, the spirit of God is is always present and active in our lives if we are believers, but we can choose to disregard it and ignore it. We can choose to not participate in the giftings of the Spirit that we know, we know the Lord gave us. The Holy Spirit is every bit God as Jesus is God, as the Father is God. And if the Spirit leading you were to lead you down the wrong path, he would no longer be God. The Bible teaches us that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all three in one and that they are in each other perfect. 
that they cannot lie, they cannot steal, they cannot mislead. And so I want to challenge you this morning to be obedient to the voice of the Lord in your life. You know, maybe you're not comfortable with that term, Holy Spirit. Maybe that's something that's kind of foreign to you. But like when I say the voice of the Lord in your life or the leading of the Holy Spirit or uh, a prompting from the Lord or a word of knowledge from the Lord, all those things are, are, are kind of saying the same kind of thing. The Lord is speaking. And here's what I have been hearing this morning. As we were driving in, I, I've been really just asking God, what, what do you have for today? What do you have for today? Because I've, I, I've, I've heard nothing about how I'm supposed to end. And I felt like the Lord just kind of gave me a little bit of knowledge this morning. And so in a minute here, we're going to dismiss. And, and it's a true dismissal. If, if you uh, want to go on about your day, if you've got places to be, things to do, by all means, go do that. God bless you. Have a great week. It's awesome. But I felt like the Lord said a couple of specific things this morning. There were some specific needs that were going to be here today. I felt like the Lord said that there were two people that were going to be here today that really needed a desperate touch in their body. Whether that's a healing from something that's already existing or that's a preemptive, I'm waiting for the result on but I believe that I heard from the Lord that there are two people that need that this morning. And I believe that I also heard that there was one person or, or maybe or a couple of people maybe that uh, needed a relationship in their life restored through the power of Jesus. That things are just falling apart and but for the grace of God, but for the mercy of God, it, it's over. I don't, I don't know if that's marriage or friendship. I have no idea. I'm not pretending to know anything that I don't. But I believe that I heard the Lord say, those two groups of people need a special prayer. So here's what we're gonna do. In just a minute, I want you all to go on about your day and I want you to be blessed. I want you to ponder on this word. I want you to tune your ear to hear the Holy Spirit and I want you to have courage to obey it. But if you're one of those people, one of those three people, maybe there's more, Maybe you have even another need that the Lord didn't say anything to me about, but it's, it, it is a need. We're going to pray. We're going to pray through some things if we have to. I said this to our, our leadership team that was here pre-service, and I'm going to open this up to you all as well. If you're not one of those that needs something, a touch from the Lord today, but you just want to be active in participating and praying over these needs, I want you to to join us in this as well. So if you have a need, I want you to come down front. If you want to help pray over, minister to these needs, I want you to also come down front. And if you don't fit into either of those two categories, hear the Holy Spirit this week. Be obedient. See how it changes your life because he will never lead you wrong. He will only lead you towards good according to the will of the Father. That's a big promise. Take advantage of it, carry it with you every moment of every day as you wake up, as you go to sleep, as you, as you eat, as you interact with your children, as you walk in the spirit, talk in the spirit, obey the spirit, amen? Amen. Have a great week. If you need prayer, if you want to pray, we're going to be available and we'll be here as long as we need to be. Have a great week, everybody.